Hi, my name is Anthony Ruggiano Jr., and I am the son of Anthony Fat Andy Ruggiano, who became a main member of the American Mafia in 1953. When I became a teenager at 16, I followed my father into that life, and he started schooling me. He was a member of the Gambino crime family at that time. I started working for him at the age of 16. I started using drugs uh, around that time and committing crimes with him. When I was age 23, I went to prison for the first time. When I came out, I was uh, friendly with John Gotti through my father's association. I started started uh, running around with that crew and also continued using drugs. My father was a high-ranking member of the Gambino family. In 1984, my father was arrested by the FBI. At that point in time, I was still in the street. I started freebasing cocaine, and I guess that's when I crossed over the line into addiction. My father was doing 40 years in prison. John Gotti was the boss of the Gambino family at the time. I had a very good relationship with him. Welcome, all you wiretappers out there. It's good to have you back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. I have a, a really Really special guest today, and uh, and if you're out there on YouTube and, and you're a real mob fan and a YouTube mob fan, you know there's a lot of guys that were formerly in the life that are out there on YouTube, uh, Sammy the Bull, Michael Franchise, but we have another guy who was part of the Gambino family, Anthony Ruggiano Jr., and I've got him right here in the studio with me if you're on YouTube, and if you're not, you're going to hear him in a few minutes. Thanks a lot, guys, for listening, and welcome, Anthony. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm really glad, glad to have you on here. This is like a kind of a new phenomenon. All you guys that were formerly in the life with YouTube channels, Bobby Luisi, and yeah. there's just a, 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 quite a few of you. So it's, uh, you know, what a, what a, what a difference of 30 years makes, huh? <laughs> very true. Very true. <laughs> I'm waiting for somebody in Kansas City to come in and start a YouTube channel or want to well, co-host with me. I don't see it coming, though. <laughs> uh, well, there was a big mob family in Kansas City at one time. I don't know what happened to them. There was. Well, you know, there's still our, one of our last surviving guys just died uh, yesterday. Actually, I started getting calls yesterday afternoon. Did you hear right? Willie Camasano Jr. died and he got COVID yeah. really bad and then got wow. uh, had a stroke and and he was kind of the last of the there was only one more old school guy from back in the 70s and 80s when they were at their yeah. peak left so yeah. you know it, it's all changing and, and as you know so let's talk about your life in mm. the mob now we've heard a little bit about it you guys you know you, you did a little lead in with with anthony and and kind of where he came from and and how he grew up and and so you know you your father's in prison, you're in your 20s, and, and you're part of the Gambino family, or is it Gotti family by then, or you're part of the Gotti crew, right? Yes. Um, yeah, I grew up in Ozone Park. My father and John Gotti both come out of East New York, Brooklyn. Um, they both wind up moving into Ozone Park, Howard Beach area, so I grew up in Howard Beach in Ozone Park. I was introduced to John Gotti at a young age of 13 through my father. Because my father knew him from when he was a teenager. And uh, yeah, so I was part of that crew. Um, I wasn't directly with him. I was with Tony Lee and my father. And we had a social club a few blocks away from the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. But that was the crew I ran around with. That's that social club thing. That's kind of an interesting little phenomenon to me here in Kansas <laughs> City and, and people outside of New York City. May, there's a little bit of it in Chicago, but... But boy, in New York, that social club thing. And so your father had his own social club and he was part of Gotti's crew. And so, you know, what was it like, that social club? What was that like? Well, it's, you know, it's like people ask me that all the time. It's like, you know, guys on Wall Street go to their office on Wall Street and guys in the mob go to their office in the social club. I mean, every crew, when I was younger, had a social club. And my neighborhood in Ozone Park, I mean, Probably all five families had a club there. And it was just a meeting place. It was like home base. It's somewhere where we all went during the day. We met. We would have lunch there. We'd socialize. People would come there to meet us. And we would plan out our day there. It was just a gathering place um, that we socialized in and fellowshiped in. And, uh, and people would come there. Like my father, you know, always held court. And his John Gotti had his uh, social club. And every Saturday he ate lunch there. So people would know he was there every Saturday. And it was just a place where we met and and talked about things that needed to be talked about. Joe Pistone once said that guys sit around and plan out different scores all day long. And, and so I'm sure you planned out scores. What do you remember a particular score that you set? How did, how did that go down, planning out a score? Oh, yeah, sure. So we, 
we would plan out, you know, we had a big a policy ring and we would all start out in the club and we would plan our day who was going to go to the street, who was going to answer the phones. I mean, you know, some and actually in some social clubs, there was homicides were committed in them. I mean, you know, uh, so, um, yeah, my I planned out like I would I would I had a at one point I had a, a credit card uh, fraud ring. I had a big credit card fraud ring and we would meet at my father's social club, Cafe Liberty. And like I would send one crew out in a van to Pennsylvania, I would send another crew out to Long Island. And then at the end of the day, we'd meet all back there. We'd collect all the money we needed to collect. We'd cut it up. So it was like a business office. Mm -hmm. So how how did that credit card thing work? Did you have a bunch of stolen cards or a bunch of uh, uh, faked accounts and send smurfs out, so to speak, and they'd like go to stores and use them and and bring the stuff back? Right. So in the 90s, we had a guy in the post office that was selling us uh, credit cards and we we would pay him $50 an envelope for a credit card. And he used to give me stacks of them at a time. And then we would, yeah, we would send guys out. We would buy electronics. We would buy air conditioners. We were back, back then in the day, palm quarters, Nintendo's, jewelry. And then we had one guy that we would bring it all to and we would sell it to him for 50 So if, if we paid $99 or $100 for an item, we'd sell it to him for $40 or $50. So, and he would buy all the items. We had another guy. Uh, we had an Asian fella that we would buy cigarettes all day. We would buy 100, 200 cartons of cigarettes and through in CVSs and Walgreens throughout Long Island. And then we'd bring them to this one fella and he would buy each carton for $10. So we, uh, we had we had a pretty good, I made a lot, a lot of money with, with, uh, with credit cards. And then we also had a vending business. We had gambling machines. We had slot machines, joker poker machines. Um, listen, the mob makes money any way they can. Yeah. But I have to say one thing, the way I made money back then, I, I couldn't do that today with all the technology and the cameras everywhere and, and all the optics they have, all this, you know, I, I can never earn money like that today. Yeah, you would have to hire a bunch of young guys that could get online and, and do the scams online. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I don't know nothing about that. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, I just know enough about it that that's the way to do it today. You yeah. cannot go out in the stores. I don't know how anybody would do a, a, a hit or a murder today with all the cameras out there and, and it, DNA it, and all that. It's almost impossible. Possible. It's almost impossible because I mean, there's cameras and doorbells, and even even with everything else, even with gambling, bookmaking. I don't know how, like the mob today, everybody has apps. I mean, every state it's legalized in every state. I mean, so who's going to bet with a bookmaker, a street guy, a guy that's struggling for money? I mean, all the anybody that has money now is going to just download an app and bet yeah. with Caesars and MGM. So, you know, it's just a different world, you know, and it's funny because everything I went to jail for now is legal. Yeah, I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some people that are still in jail for doing things that were now illegal. So exactly. it's a, it's a, uh, it's a crazy world sometimes, yes. <laughs> Anthony. It's, yes. it's hard to keep up. But, you know, that life, uh, I you know, me being a policeman, I followed guys like you around. I sat on our social club down here quite a little bit. I once spent... Uh, Super Bowl Sunday in the uh, roof or up, up in the attic of a community center down the street. And and when I'd see the right car pull up, then I'd call the FBI plant, they called it, the office, the O or the wire room and say, hey, uh, you know, Vincey's in there so they could turn on the mic. Right. And, and so that's, did you, do you remember the, the, the police, do you remember them Were they, you know, to do counter surveillance or, you know, how was your relationship with the police and the FBI and, and probably New York city police, maybe they didn't do so much as we did here in Kansas city. I don't know. What was that like? Oh no, they were honest all the time. I was always being followed. My father was always being followed. They was always, they were always around. Um, you know, I used to see them on my corner, you know, I used to wave to them. You know, when 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 I stopped seeing them was when I got arrested. <laughs> so yeah. I was always under surveillance. I mean, in Florida, I was under surveillance. I mean, I even went to Europe once on vacation and they notified Interpol mm-hmm. and I had Interpol following me around Paris. Um, so I was always under surveillance. Um, and any time my doorbell rang five o'clock in the morning, I know who it was. And, you know, I always left my house in handcuffs. So I was always under surveillance. It just was part of our life. You know, it was just part of life, you know. Um, but we knew they were always around. Law enforcement was always around. But they, they, were, they were respectful. You know, if I had to get a, a couple of times I got indicted, they'd call, they'd call us up. Yeah. 
and you know, and I would surrender. They just wouldn't come and drag me out of my house. Um, so, so they were they we respected them. They did their job, and you know, they respected us. We did our job. So, um, but I was always under surveillance in my later in the especially in the nineties. And then I mean, I, I was uh, I got arrested in nine. In 89, by the Organized Crime Task Force in New York State, I got it for a policy. I went to prison for that. And then I got rearrested again in 95 by, again, by the by the Queens Organized Crime Task Force. But I was very unlucky. In 1989, I, I, I could, I'll tell you a quick little story about surveillance. So in 1989, we were, had a number office in Jamaica, Queens, which was, um, you know, it was the hood. And we had a number, a number office in there. And on the corner of the block where our offices was a house where some Jamaican Rastafarians were selling weed out of, and they were under surveillance. A guy that stood with John Gotti for some reason decided to come and see us at our office. And the the the, the surveillance for the marijuana saw this guy and said, Hey, what is this guy doing here? He hangs out with John Gotti. They recognized him. Yeah. They called up the organized crime task force and said, Listen. We just saw Freddie Hot walking into this building in Jamaica, Queens. What is this guy doing in this neighborhood? To make a long story short, the, the Queens DA organized crime task force put somebody on that building and found and and I did us and I got arrested for policy and I went to prison for that. So we were always, you know, we were so well known. It was just uh, that's what it was. And they used to tease us when they arrested us. They used to tell us we love to follow guys like you. You go to the best restaurants the best clubs they love to follow us <laughs> yeah really <laughs> what uh, did you have any particular techniques that you used that uh to, to if you wanted to, uh, to drop a tail off and get away to do something uh that you didn't want any want yeah to yeah around? we would park cars in, in we would park cars in underground garages or we would get on the subway we would you know i i, I would i would uh i would get on the train the a train on liberty avenue i would take the a train get off at another station have somebody pick me up um or i would go in buildings that had two entrances you know i would go in apartment buildings like uh in brooklyn there was an apartment building in Sheepshead bay that had multiple and it was like a little city and you go in the building and this had multiple exits and entrances so we had ways when we needed to get away. We got away. Or well, we hope we got away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you probably did. It's tough. It's tough. Yeah. I've been on the other end of that a lot. I just heard a story about a guy we used to follow a lot, Joe Ragusa, and, and he was working at a plumbing supply place. And and he asked a customer that came in and said, hey, would you give me a ride down to the city market? And he said, well, sure. So Joe gets in, he lays down in the guy's back seat and he drives him down to the city market. And, you know, we were sitting yeah. on the outside, you know, we right. didn't, you know, yeah, we you just saw know. this guy come yeah. and go. So yeah, now it's GPS. Every car now, they got computers, GPS that can follow you with your phone. I mean, now forget <laughs> it. Now, how do you get away today? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. Yeah. I'll tell you what, if I stood it today, I'd, I'd just get me one of those GPS locators and somebody I was interested in, just slap it up underneath your car. Yeah, and that's it. That's <laughs> it. Watch it from the office. <laughs> yeah, you can watch it from the satellites now. Watch it from the satellite. Mm -hmm. Now you can get a drone and follow you around. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I even was followed by a helicopter. What? We had a we had a number a big number runner in 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 uh in Long Island, and he was so big and we made so much money with him that we personally handled him like we didn't let somebody that worked for us handle him and my uh this guy Carl Amato who who ran the number business for my father and myself would go out there and meet him every Monday and I used to tell my just my friend Carl Carl. Every Monday when we're driving out here, I see a helicopter. He goes, what do you think? This is good fellows? You know, he's teasing me because if you remember in the movie, yeah. Henry Hill was, he goes, what are you kidding me? What are you, what are you, what are you back on that shit again? Because I was clean at the time. Yeah. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, no, I, for some reason, every time we come out here, I noticed there's a helicopter. Sure enough, after we got arrested and we got all the, uh, all the, you know, they had to turn over everything to us. Sure enough, we're in our lawyer's office and our lawyer picks up a paper out of the box and he goes, holy shit, air, aerial surveillance. <laughs> I, I said, I told you they were following me with a helicopter. <laughs> yeah. That's how crazy it was. Yeah, our guys figured out they, they'd stop and they'd just look up. Yeah. They saw It was a light plane. It wasn't a helicopter. The Bureau had a plane. They saw the same plane like make this big lazy circle they knew. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. you know what they do? There's an airport real close to downtown. 
and they drive into that airport and then back out the other side real quick. So yeah, they right. knew the plane couldn't follow them in because of the flight pattern. So, <laughs> yeah. And my father was always under surveillance. My father would go to like just sit in bars all day and not meet nobody, and just sit there all day and drink and eat. And they would just have to hang around all day. Yeah. They actually used to tell him once in a while, Andy, are you going to go eat dinner? Like they used to ask <laughs> if he was going to go to a restaurant. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm curious about that numbers thing. That's something we didn't really have in Kansas City, and, right. and we had sports book. So in New York, it started out many. It started out at the turn of the century in Harlem. They invented the game. Um, then the Italian guys took it over. How it worked was every, every day in a racetrack, an Aqueduct racetrack or Belmont racetrack, they have what they call. Um, they put the chart in of all the results of the races, and on the bottom of the chart is how much money the track handled that day. On all nine races, so it would say like two million three hundred and forty thousand and five hundred and sixty dollars. The number that day would be five six zero. It was the last three numbers of the mutual handle. So and people would bet, and we would pay them five hundred to one. That was the odds that we wow. paid them, and we would give the runners twenty five. So you would, let's say you worked in a factory, and you were our runner. You would. Everybody in the factory would play the, the, the number with you, and we would give you 25%. So if you brought me $100 worth of action, you would make $25. And then you would get a piece of the hit because we would pay the customer. We would pay the runner 550 to one, but he would pay the customer 500 to one. Okay. So, so the runner stood to make a nice piece of change and because you're dependent on runners because you needed volume. And, uh, and it was always the, the, the mutual handle of the racetrack. Okay. So then that money would slowly but surely make it up the pyramid. Right. To different people and then end up at the social club, I assume, or with somebody right. that was. So what it to- was, right. So this is how it works. It, it was, it was like a, a, it was like a corporation. So there was controllers. So let's, so what a controller was like, I, let's, we were controllers. So we were controllers of this neighborhood, Jamaica, Queens, where we had, 50 runners. So we were the controller. So we we collected all the work, all, all the numbers, and we turned them numbers into a bank, a banker who, who banked the work. We got we we got 25% from the banker. And it trickled down. So yeah, and we would we would meet in the social club, then we would go. We used like people's houses. We paid their rent, we paid their, and we would go there in the houses, legitimate people in the neighborhood. We would do do the figures. We would make up a ribbon, which you call the ribbon, and that was the daily figure. We would give the ribbons to the runners to tell them how much they had to pay us, what they owed us, because we would add up all the work. We would add up each individual bet. Wow. So we knew exactly how much money everybody was bringing in and how much of a percentage everybody got. And then it turned into the lotto. Now this government runs it. Listen, I was in, it's funny, because I was in, I was in, um, I went to a little bodega in New York a while, a couple of months ago, and I walked in to play the lotto and all this guy had in the store was a lotto machine. <laughs> and it was like a number hole. That was like an old school number hole, but only yeah. thing he had a lotto machine. So 20 years ago, that probably was somebody's number spot. Yeah. Now they I'll just swapped it out for a lotto machine. <laughs> That's crazy. But it was crazy. big money. My father's business was, we were doing, we were doing $90,000 a day in business. Wow. You know, we weren't making wow. 90,000, but the volume, yeah, we, volume. Were, we were bringing in 90,000, some days $99,000 a day in numbers because everybody played numbers back in the day. It was just, you know, there was number runners in the dice games. There was number runners in all the social clubs and the bars and the businesses. I mean, everybody played numbers, you know, families bank numbers. So, so, so like everybody today plays the lotto It was the same way, but there were was no lotto. We were the lotto. Hmm. So you got a hundred thousand dollar handle. Is that what they call that? A hundred thousand dollar. We were making we gross in about a hundred thousand a day in business. And, and so, what was your net on that? What would you drag from that? When on a we you know, our end was twenty five percent. Twenty. Okay. Well, oh, that's that's huge. Did you ever did you ever have a number that? A lot of people, there's a movie, oh, an old yeah. movie about some number that everybody hit one day. And then Wipe out. Put the bank out. You Big time. It, you, know, it hap- you know, when it happens, believe it or not, when there's a disease, like there was, there was a plane crash in New York many, many years ago. A plane crashed in Rockaway, landing at JFK. And 
I forgot what the number was. The flight number was nine something, 968 or flight 968. And that number came out the next day. We got destroyed. Like everybody <laughs> played it, you know, like, uh, every, like there's some numbers that are cut like seven. Some numbers are cut numbers because everybody played like 711. Yeah. Everybody plays um, 669. They called that the death number. Everybody plays that. So there's certain numbers that are cut because everybody plays them. Huh. Interesting. Now that now the lotto machine, they'll just shut you out. So that it's all really? computerized. Now, now if they hit a certain ceiling, they'll just cut the number out. They'll shut you out. Huh. Oh, but darn. Well, that's that's that is really interesting. That is uh, uh, an inside look at the numbers game. I'm not. I've always heard about it, and I've kind of talked about it in other stories I've done, but I've never really got an insider's uh, uh, explanation of how it works. I really appreciate that. So now uh, you start. You did some narcotics in your life, is my understanding, and everybody does, especially if you're a heavy drinker, like I understand you were. And did you ever get enticed into the narcotics business? Um. We in the seventies, we we had a my brother had a very 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 huge marijuana business, but I never so I mean he made a lot of money selling marijuana back in the day, which is now legal. Another thing that's legal, yeah. 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 Uh, but back then it wasn't. Uh, he made a ton of money selling marijuana. But we weren't. I never. I mean, I had I've sold drugs, but I was never into it on a large scale. I mean, I you know yeah. I move a little yeah. here a little, but I my father was against selling drugs. He was one of the few mob guys that lived that that believed in that rule that they shouldn't sell drugs, and he didn't. He wasn't involved. I mean, he used to pass up a lot of heroin deals, and I that I used to argue with him over. So I wanted to do it him, and he didn't. But no, I was never really into selling drugs, but I got into unfortunately using drugs. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and let's kind of go down that path a little bit. Now you, you were drinking a lot, you're using drugs and, and at some point in time, it probably got in the way of your day-to-day -day life. How did you, what, how did you deal with that? How, how did that come down? Yeah. So, well, you know, I mean, in the beginning, it started out as fun and games, like, like it always did, yeah. you know what I mean? It started out as, I mean, you know, I'm in this, it's in the seventies, I'm making big money. My father's a big shot, big gangster. So I got caught. I'm got card blanche in Manhattan. You know, everybody's blowing coke and drinking. You know, and I grew up in bars. My father owned the bars my whole life, so I I felt very comfortable in a bar with a drink in my hand. And all, and so I I would drink every day, but I never woke up looking for a drink. I wasn't. I never looked up craving alcohol, but eventually, the cocaine. I you know was blowing coke cocaine in the 70s. Then, like I said earlier, I went to prison in 78. When I got out of prison in 80, uh, I got introduced to free base cocaine mm. and I started free base and cocaine. So I, I was between those were my darkest years, like from 80, 84 to 89 when I got clean. Um, then my father had gotten arrested. When my father got arrested, I started getting out of control. Then I crossed over that imaginary line and like everything became about, you know, the next one, you know, how am I going to get more coke, to smoke more coke? And I started doing a lot of crazy stuff, taking money off people. Uh, you know, my father was in prison. Um, but, you know, nobody, um, you know, John Gotti still always looked out for me for some reason. I don't know why he always did. Um, and my father, you know, felt really bad, you know. And then um, I don't know. You know, um, I just woke up one day and, and um you know, I went I went into my bathroom and 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 I was like, 140 pounds, man. I was like skin and bones. I was married. I had a five-year-old son at the time and I was lost. Like I just was lost. And, um, and I walked outside. And I remember and I was sitting on my bed and I was like, and I was just going like, God, how did this happen to me? And, but I was talking out loud, you know, how, God, how did this happen to me? And my wife walked in at, and she got nervous and she said to me, you know, what's the matter? And I told her I, I'm dying. And that's how I felt. You know, I felt at that point in time that, the path I was on, I was going to die. And I was afraid to die. If I don't stop using the, the drugs, I was going to die. And um, there was a commercial on TV back then in 88 of a nose and a car went up its nose and a house went up its nose because there was no internet. There was no yeah. smartphones. Yeah. There was, the TV went off at three o'clock in the morning, you know? So, so I told my wife, call this phone number that was on this commercial and she called it, you know, and this woman answered the phone and named Joan Devonzo. I'll never forget her name. She used. She saved my life. And she told me I spoke to her and she told me I should go into treatment, but I had no money. 
So I called up my father's partner, Tony Lee, who was another wise guy in the Gambino family. And he came over and I told him uh, uh, I needed to go to this treatment center. And he goes, yeah, I know you do, you know. Um, and uh, I said, but I need, I have no money. So he looked at me, he used to call me Sonny. That was his nickname for me. He went, Sonny, I'm going to pay for this. But as far as I'm concerned, you're too far gone. And I said, well, I got to try. And he um, and he paid for it. And I went to this treatment center and uh, and they gave me some tools. I didn't know anything about recovery. I just knew I had to stop. But, you know, it's funny because I just thought I needed to stop using chemicals and I would have a great life. So I did. I, I got out of treatment. And believe it or not, I got out of treatment on a Wednesday. That Saturday, I went to see John Gotti and he bought me a car. Because I had no car. And he asked me, what could I do for you? I don't want you to get stressed out, he told me. And I <laughs> says, well, I don't have a car. And he got me a car. And he, and, and he gave me $2,000. He loaned me money, $2,000. So, so, so I got clean and I went right back to the street. You suffer consequences behind your behavior. So I went back to the street. I thought recovery was all monetary stuff, you know, everything on the outside. And I didn't know it was an inside out job. So I went back to the street. I'm clean. I'm making meetings um, because the treatment center showed me how to stay clean, gave me some tools. And I started using these tools and I started putting together some clean time, some sobriety. And I started making a lot of money again. And I started looking good. You know, I'm running around now with John Gotti. He's the boss of the Gambino family. I have a great relationship with him. I'm running around. I'm making a lot of money. And I was clean and sober two years and I got arrested for numbers. I went to prison. I stood clean in prison because um, I refused to use at that point. I, I, I just couldn't use anymore. I didn't want, want the consequences. When I was in prison, I actually started a meeting in prison because I wanted to stay close to the fellowship I belonged to. You know yeah. what I mean? So I got out of prison in 92 and I went right back to the street again. John Gotti had gotten arrested when I was away with Sammy the Bull. They were gone. I got out and... Um, you know, and I just went right back to what I knew how to do, you know, running around with the wise guys, doing errands for my father. My father was in prison. I was meeting guys in Philly. I was running all around. I was meeting with Joey Molina, bringing messages from, from the Gambino family to Philadelphia. You know, everybody trusted me. Um, I, I, I knew the game. I knew that life. You know, I was raised by my father and the life was great. I thought it was. And then I started hitting the bottom with that lifestyle, you know, like, you could, you know, I started feeling uncomfortable again in my own skin, you know, and, um, and then in 95, I got arrested again on a big bookmaking case, um, which now is legal to bookmaking. Yeah. I got arrested again on a big bookmaking case with uh, guys in Brooklyn and Queens. And I took a plea. I got a two to four and I was upstate in a, in a penitentiary in New York. And I got indicted in Miami by the feds, by the mm -hmm. FBI, by the Justice Department, with a lot of with this guy, Nikki Carraza, who was like the street boss of the Gambino family and a couple of other people. And um, the marshals took me to Florida and I took a plea down there and I got 10 years. And oh. that's when I made up my mind. Like, like I, I pretty much was done with that lifestyle too. You know, I, I did eight years and three months. I stood clean. I didn't use in prison. You know, uh, I started meetings in prison. Um, I helped a lot of guys in prison with recovery, you know, um, uh, because I refused to use. I didn't want to go. I knew the only chance I had to change my life was to stay sober, clean and sober, you know. And um, I got out of prison in 04 and I went to work. I got my first legitimate job. I got my first legitimate job. And then about a year later, after I got out of prison in 05, unfortunately, I got arrested again by the FBI for something I did in 1988. Uh, I committed, uh, you know, I got arrested for, for a murder. And uh, for another federal RICO with a murder. And uh, then I just decided to uh, end that lifestyle altogether. And, and I cooperated. Oh, wow. That was a big step. Yeah. Judging how big you step. were raised and everything. Was your father still alive then? No, my father, no, if my father was still alive, I could have never cooperated. I would have never done that. No, my father passed away when I was in prison. That's another thing. My father passed away in 1999 while I was in prison. I, stood, I, didn't, I didn't pick up. You know, um, his partner died. John Gotti died. So when I got out of prison in 04, all the, the men that I looked up to that took care of me, that I loved, were gone. The mob was a different was a different world out there when I got out in 04. Nobody was looking out for nobody. Um, and, you know, I just, just uh, it was like the drugs. I just didn't want to live that way anymore. You know, I hit a bottom with, with that lifestyle. I mean, how much more time am I going to spend in prison? I mean, you know, like, what did I get sober for to spend my life in prison? I did more time clean and sober than I did when 
but I was getting high, you know. Wow. Um, so I just knew that would be the best way or the, not the best way, but that would be the final straw of me getting out of that life. There's no going back after that. Because I was still on the fence. When I got out in 04, they wanted to make me. I was proposed. I was a proposed member. So I was on the verge of becoming a main member. So I was still on the fence. I didn't say no. So like, you know, like it was like the devil and the angel, you know, like, yeah. you know, so so that was just the final. That finalized me getting out of that lifestyle, I guess you could say. I guess you knew if you took that other step of taking that oath, there would not would not be any turning back and you were likely would spend most of the rest of your life in the penitentiary. Was that your thought process on that? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The thought process was that my father was pet. My father was dead. Tony Lee was dead. Like I said, John was dead. I know if they were alive, I would have never cooperated. I would have never gave up my father. I mean, if I had to spend the rest of my life in prison, I, you know, I, I wouldn't have liked it, but I, I wouldn't have gave up my father. Yeah, that was my process, you know, like um, I just wanted to get away from it. Nobody, you know, it just wasn't the same anymore. I think it's probably so enticing. It's like the drug. It's this high and low and high and low that you keep chasing after another high. Is that would that be a good analogy? Oh, yeah, great. It was great. In the beginning, it was great. It's like it's all instant gratification. I mean, I'm making crazy money. I'm living like a king. I'm I got carte blanche in Manhattan. I'm going to the Copacabana. I'm, I'm sitting in the front row, ringside seats. You know, like it, it was. It was like in the movies. It was great. Yeah. It was beautiful. But you know, then it wasn't. You know, but then, then you know, then I spent 14 years in prison. I winded up with, you know, two failed marriages. You know, a, a drug problem. You know, broke. My father doing 40 years. You know, victims, people dying, people getting killed. You know, uh, people's mothers crying. You know, um, look. You know, it, it, we did a lot of damage. But you know, that was, that was the hardest and most traumatic decision I ever made in my whole life. I mean, it took me a whole year to make that decision. I couldn't, I couldn't even make the phone call when, when I did, when I finally made the decision to do that, I, I couldn't even call them. I made my wife call the FBI from her job. Like not even, I didn't want to hear her do it. I told her, take this card. And when you get to work, call this number and tell whoever answers the phone to come and see me. I couldn't, I couldn't even make the call. You know, that's how, because of, you know, every, all my, everything I believed in. And, and I knew that was the end of it. You know, that was the end of, of the, of the only life I ever knew. You know, I was born into the mafia. My, my father became a made member the same year I was born in 1953. I mean, so I was literally born into the mafia. Really? So, and that's all I knew. Those are all the adults I knew, all the adult males in my neighborhood outside of my uncles who were legitimate guys were all mob guys. My father's friends were all mob guys. So, Anthony, you've gone over what it was like, what happened. Now, what's it like now for you? <laughs> now, it's about contentment, believe it or not. All I could, you know, people ask me that question a lot. And, you know, I was never content in my whole life. No matter how much money I was making or how I was living, I, it, was, it was always about more, more, more. Now, now it's I'm content. You know, my all my needs are being met. Some of my wants aren't, but we all have wants that are a little extravagant, but all my needs are being met. You know, I'm content. I sit in my condo, you know, uh, and, and I don't have to worry about getting arrested. I don't have to worry about, you know, making going running into the streets to make money. You know, every two weeks I get a paycheck deposited in my checking account um, and I'm content. And, you know, and today I give back, you know, I feel good. You know, people want to know my story. I, you know, people are interested in me. I help people, you know, I work in treatment, drug treatment. I work in treatment centers. I was a counselor, a case manager. Now I'm a, I'm a behavioral health technician. You know, I'm, I work in recovery every day. I'm working in the detox right now. Um, so I'm, I'm helping people now that are just coming off the street at the beginning of the journey, you know, which is which is very interesting <laughs> in the beginning of the journey, you know. Um, yeah, really. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's just I'm just content. That's the best answer I could give you. You know, and I'm involved in, uh, you know, I have my own podcast now. We form gangsters, if anybody's interested, right. you know, which is going really well, you know. And I think, with some, and like, there's a lot of us out there with podcasts. Some are really good. Some aren't, you know, some are really truthful. Some aren't. I think what separates me from a lot of them is like with the stories I tell or the, or the things I talk about, about my own personal relationships. Most of the people I talk about, I had relationships with, even, you know, like good fellows and, you know, it's things like that. So I think that sort of separates me a little bit from a lot of other ones. 
And, uh, you know, I have a helpline. I have a recovery helpline that I, that people call. Uh, it's 855-963-2113. And that's a recovery helpline where people can call up. And if they need help with addiction, with alcoholism, with drug addiction, they call that number. And uh, someone answers it 24-7. And, you know, we look to help people get into treatment or do whatever we could do for them to get them on their journey to, you know, live a better life. You've had one heck of a life, Anthony, and <laughs> and, and I, I can relate to everything that you've been through kind of on the other side, and, right. and I haven't had a drink or anything since 1984, and, and, and you know, it's it's such a good life. Uh, that life that, that seemed, you think was boring is much more exciting than it ever was back in the old days, and yeah. with less consequences, much more pleasant consequences, wouldn't you say? Oh, without a doubt. You know, when I speak out of me or I speak at, a, at an event or something about my recovery, about my life, and some young guy or somebody walks up to me and asks me for my phone number, that's, you know, that's the greatest feeling in the world. You know, that's worth more money than anything, you know, yeah. to, to, for someone to ask me for my, you want me, my phone number? Like, you know, I said something that touched that person, you know, it, that's uh, so gratifying. All right, Anthony, I really appreciate you coming on the show. And guys, uh, Anthony's YouTube is Reformed Gangsters. Yes, reformedgangsters.com. Yep. All right, great. And and so go to that website and and check him out on YouTube. He's got a lot of great stories. He has a lot of good guests. They're like personal friends of his that you yes. know, really get that inside story on 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 what that life was like because that's you know that's what you're on this podcast for is to to figure out what that life's like. It's is fascinating. It's interesting. I I think. You know, Anthony, for me, what's interesting is that in the mafia, there's rules. There's people have lives, they have families, they have regular lives on one hand. But yet on the other hand, they have this other life that is like this whole kind of secret society that I don't know. There's just something about that that is fascinating for a lot of people. And I can't explain it. It's like we all love Jesse James. <laughs> yeah, it's just a unique, it's a unique lifestyle. Not not thank God not everybody could do it. <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's true. I couldn't do it. <laughs> all right, Anthony, I really appreciate you coming on. Thank the show. you. Thank you. Have a good day. Well, guys, that was great. Uh, I really appreciate Anthony coming on the show. And don't forget, I ride motorcycles, so watch out for motorcycles out on the road. And if you have a problem with PTSD, your friend or your relative has a problem with PTSD, and you've been in the service, go to the uh, VA website and get that hotline number. If you have a problem with drugs or alcohol, why well, you'll see that number that I've got up, or, or Anthony's got it on his YouTube channel all the time. And and even if you're in another part of the United States, give that number a call, and they can probably direct you to local resources so thanks a lot guys and thank you anthony thank you thank you thank you thank you